Hi, I'm Chad, and welcome to my virtual garage. In front of me, we have my virtual 2017 Aprilia 210 V4 factory. And today's video is going to be a how-to for a modification that quite a few people have actually asked me to do. Today, we are going to be removing my 210's EVAP canister or charcoal canister. Now the reason, of course, this video is in virtual reality is because the EVAP canister is a critical component to the bike's emissions system and ensuring that the bike is road legal. But because we're in virtual reality, where no such regulations exist, we can go ahead and remove this troublesome piece of equipment. If you're unfamiliar with the anatomy of your 2017 to 2020 Aprilia 210 V4 or Aprilia RS V4, well, let me get you acquainted. This canister right here, you may have seen it before behind the left side fairing and wondered what it is. This is the evaporative emissions canister. The purpose of this canister is to catch vapors that escape from the gas tank as well as overspilled fuel and prevent it from reaching the environment. So if you look here, you'll notice that there are two hoses. The center hose is the hose that runs off of the fuel tank. So that's the hose through which vapors are gonna travel as well as fuel if you accidentally overfill your gas tank. And then the second hose over here on the side, so offset from the center of the canister, runs back up to the air box. So vapors will get trapped in here and through the vacuum that is naturally generated by the engine running, those vapors will get sucked up into the engine and hopefully be burnt and maybe add 0 0.00000001 horsepower. So at this point in the video, you might be asking yourself, why would I want to remove this canister? I'm gonna say there's a chance that if you're watching this video, it's because your canister is causing issues for your bike. There's a few issues that this canister causes. The first and the biggest complaint most people have with these things, and I want to preface this by saying this doesn't happen to every 210 V4 and RS V4. It is something that comes up on the forums and is a common issue per se, but if I had to guess, and again, this is just a guess, I would say that this probably only affects less than 10% or even less than 5% of 210 V4 and RS V4 owners. But what happens is this gets plugged up over time with overspilled fuel and vapors, and when it gets plugged up, this hose that runs back up to the gas tank is also the breather. If you'll notice, there's this little plug right here on the bottom, and that is so that it can suck air in as well. As fuel is burned and consumed through the fuel pump in the engine, the fuel volume drops, and being that your fuel system is pressurized, there has to be some way for air to make it in to occupy the space that was previously occupied by fuel. Otherwise, a few different things can happen. The first thing that can happen is the tank can resist the pressure of the fuel pump, causing your engine to stall. That is the primary issue that people report on the forums. Canister gets plugged up. When you go to hot start your bike, the canister's all hot. It's restricting flow back into the gas tank of air to replenish the fuel that's being consumed so the bike won't start or won't run for long. Now, the second issue is that this canister, again, being that it regulates pressure to a degree unintentionally within the gas tank, can actually cause your fuel tank to distort and I actually experienced this on my last Tuono, my Tuono V4 RR that I had before this beautiful factory here, where when the bike got up to operating temperature, you could feel the fuel tank expand. And if you went and pressed on the side of the tank like so, you could actually push it back in. Now, obviously these fuel tanks are made of plastic, so there's going to be some sort of give there, but it was, a pretty considerable amount. So the third and final reason that I can think of as to why you would want to remove the evap canister is because it partially blocks the radiator. As you're riding down the road, air is flowing through the motorcycle this way to cool off the coolant that is within the radiator. And if you take a close look, you'll realize that this is kind of in the way of this side of the radiator down a little bit low. You might not notice a huge issue cruising on the highway, it becomes very apparent when you're riding at low speeds or in traffic. And this is particularly because this obstructs the cooling fan to a degree. As the cooling fan kicks on to pull air through the radiator and cool off the engine, that air that comes through becomes turbulent because it doesn't really have a smooth pathway out. You've got the engine blocking here and this whole big area, half of it's taken up by the EVAP canister. I've ridden this bike for a lot longer with the canister on than I rode my 210 V4RR that I had before this bike. 
And the hottest I ever saw my Tuono RR get was 219 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. And that was out in 105 degree weather after cooking in the sun for a while. I let it sit in idle for a while and just let the fan run and it would not crack 220 degrees. The Tuono factory, I've actually watched go up to 226, possibly even 228 now that I think about it. So by removing this canister, you're enhancing your bike's cooling system's ability, thus better protecting your engine. Before we dive into the tools that we are going to need for this project, a couple words of caution. First, I highly recommend that you watch this video in its entirety before you go out and actually get started on this project, just to make sure you have a clear understanding of what you're getting yourself into. Next, this is only applicable for the 2017 to 2020 Aprilia Tuono V4 and Aprilia RS V4. If your RS V4 or Tuono V4 is a model year before 2017 or a model year after 2020, I can't guarantee that this is going to be accurate. I know for a fact that on the 2016 and earlier bikes, the EVAP canister was actually on the other side of the bike. So this process should be somewhat similar. Obviously the can's gonna be in a different spot and you're gonna to need to run a hose and some other materials accordingly. But as far as this goes, this can only be expected for a 2017 to 2020 Tuono V4 or RS V4, and it does not matter if it is an RR or a factory for either bike. And lastly, if you do decide to remove your EVAP canister, you do have a possibility of getting a fumy gasoline smell in your garage, particularly if you overfill the fuel tank or if you fill it up and then leave it in the garage for a while and you happen to have a hot day and some of the vapors kind of start to cook in the tank. It is not going to go anywhere but to the atmosphere and you might smell it in your garage. So not a cause for alarm specifically, but something to keep in mind. If you choose to do this modification, I would highly advise you against parking your bike next to a water heater or other source of open flame. Now that I've talked about why you would want to remove this thing, let's go ahead and get started. It's actually not that hard of a modification to make, but it does require a few tools and a few things that you're gonna to need to go buy from your local auto parts store. Now, some of the basic tools are things you'll probably have lying around at home. We're going to need a ratchet with a four mil bit, a five millimeter hex bit, pliers, a small flat head screwdriver, 13 millimeter socket, wire cutters and or a razor blade. I highly recommend having both handy just in case. Assorted vacuum connectors. You're gonna need at least two that are 3 16 of an inch or whatever the metric equivalent of that would be. A 3 16 inch fuel hose, at least two feet I would say. You can trim it down as needed. Rubber vacuum caps, hose clamps, zip ties, just in case your hose clamps aren't the right size. And last but not least, the key to your bike so that you can remove your seat cowl or passenger seat. So now that we have everything that we need, let's go ahead and get started by removing the seat cowl. This is done by inserting the key into the slots underneath the tail, turning in a clockwise direction and lifting the seat cowl up and off. I highly recommend going and putting this somewhere safe and is it not at risk of falling on the ground and getting scratched because it is expensive. So next we'll be removing the seat and that is done by unscrewing the two securing bolts that are just underneath the corner edges of the seat, ordinarily covered up by the seat cowl or seat. So we're gonna do that with the ratchet and the four millimeter bit. While not necessarily required, a magnetic bolt dish can actually be very helpful in keeping things nice and organized. So we'll take our two bolts and throw them in there. And with those bolts out, we can just go ahead lift the seat up and it just slides right out like so. Now with your seat removed, you're again going to take your ratchet and four millimeter bit and remove this trim panel right here. Now this is secured by three different bolts. We have one bolt that's up on the top here that goes through the black trim piece and into the tail fairing. We have another bolt over here just below the fuel tank and then another one here on the frame. Once these three bolts are free, there is a piece of Velcro and a few locating tabs that further secure this piece. So just be mindful of that and do your best to remove it gently so that you don't risk breaking your tabs. A 
voila. Now once this plastic trim panel has been removed, you're gonna see a little bit more of your motorcycle and you're gonna see specifically a hose, which we are going to need to remove and modify. That is going to be this hose. It is the second hose, so the hose on the right-hand side. There is gonna be a tricky clamp to get off that's on it. I have removed my tank and destroyed that clamp and replaced it with a better one. So this is gonna be a little bit easier for me than it is for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and use my pliers to pinch this clamp, scoot it on down the hose. Or to just get the hose off. So now that we have the lower fuel tank trim panel removed and we've disconnected this hose, we are going to go ahead and grab our four millimeter ratchet to remove this fairing. And we are also going to need a small flathead screwdriver because there are some clips that are on the back side of this that we are going to need to remove as well. We're also going to remove the turn signal, not entirely, but we're just gonna get it loose so that we have enough extra space to get the fairing off. It's pretty easy. Just tuck it up over there. Go ahead and get our flathead in there. And we'll pop this sucker off. Just be careful not to damage your fairing. That was a stubborn sucker. So once that plastic tab is free, there's another little tab right here that you just pop the thing out. And then one tab up here that you're gonna need to be careful to, that you're gonna need to be careful to dismount before you can slide the fairing back and get it off. So once that is up and free, and squeeze back in there, you just simply slide the fairing backwards and remove it. Then again, when you're doing this, there's two locating tabs. You slide it backwards carefully. You might need to put a little bit of firm pressure to it, but again, don't be too hard with it or you might break those tabs and need a new fairing, which is expensive. And then of course, we're gonna take this and put it in a safe spot where it's not gonna get scratched like we've done with everything else. Now, removing this fairing might not be absolutely necessary, but I have done it because I found the first time I did this that it gave me a little bit more room to work and just made things easier overall. Sometimes investing just a couple minutes up front will save you 10 or more in the long run. So as you can see, we now have pretty easy access to the canister here. Now we're gonna go ahead and cut these two hoses and then there are just a couple of zip ties actually that are wrapped around this thing and that should be all that is actually securing it. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut these two hoses. This center hose right here is the breather for the fuel tank, and this one is for the air box. So we are eventually going to need to plug this hose and make sure that there is no possibility of air or anything finding its way in there, because again, that is a direct feed into the air box. So just be sure not to confuse these two. So we're gonna go ahead and take our wire cutters. We're just gonna go ahead and go. It may take a little while. There we go. So, I'm gonna take this one, tuck it up here. Or actually, you know what I am gonna do is take a little bolt or something to plug it up just to mark it so it's easy to remember which one it is. So I've got just a little M6 by one bolt that I just had in my toolbox and we're just gonna go ahead and stick it up in there. That'll help us remember which one it is going forward. Go ahead and cut this guy just above the clamp. Again, be mindful of your frame and things around here because you don't want to scratch or damage anything. Nice. And then from here, it's gonna be just as easy. Grabbing these zip ties and going snip. There's one, there's two. And this thing just comes right out, and there's your evac canister. Go ahead and remove these zip ties as well, so we don't want those falling somewhere else and causing chaos. Now, as you can see, there's a lot more space around here for the cooling fan to push air out and for the radiator to just work naturally as well. 
So now that we have the EVAP canister itself out, we need to remove the bypass valve, I believe it is called. And that is going to be attached to that hose we disconnected, the rear hose on the fuel tank. So this guy's a little tricky because he's kind of wedged down in here. But if you go ahead and pull this wire up and out and just kind of give it a good old tug there. Of course, try to be careful not to scratch anything, but it is plastic. So if it rubs on the frame a little bit on the inside, it's probably going to be fine. And we are going to need to slide this hose up a bit if possible. So as you start to pull on this, being that this is actually linked to the center hose that we just cut, it might get snagged in the little metal router thing up here. So just be mindful of that and do your best to work it a little bit so that you can loosen it up and get a little bit more slack. Or actually, I'm just gonna pull it out entirely because it's not gonna run up there anyways when we're done with this. So the hose is really wedged in here. So do whatever you can, any sort of finagling again, because it might be stuck in between the engine and the frame and some other hoses and wires. So just do what you can to try to get as much slack in it as possible on this side so we can go ahead and pull it forward. We're gonna need to be able to get this part of the hose up to here. Ah, there we go. That'll do. So now from here, we can go ahead and grab our wire cutters again. Be sure you clear the frame. We're just gonna snip this guy just below the nipple that is on the bypass valve. So unfortunately, none of my hose clamps are really the right size for this. So we're just gonna go ahead and stick it on like we were before and use a zip tie instead. That hose is on there nice and tight. And do your best to get it on there as tight as possible. You don't want this hose coming loose. And once you're sure it's on there as snug as it possibly can be, just go ahead and trim that end. So now that we have our fuel hose reconnected and secured to the fuel tank, we going to go back and find the other end of the hose, which might have gotten pulled back a bit into the frame, but should still be right there. Additionally, we're going to take this hose, the vacuum hose, and we're going to go ahead and plug this up. We are going to take one of these vacuum connectors, as well as one of these rubber caps. We're going to go ahead and put the cap on one side take the vacuum line that we plugged with the screw earlier to identify it, get the screw out of there, and insert the other end. So now that we've got this plugged up, we can go ahead and check our hose clamp inventory, see if we've got one that fits. And if we don't, we can just go ahead and use another couple zip ties to just secure this connector on both sides and make sure that there is absolutely no possibility anything is gonna get in there. So we got one hose clamp on there. We're just gonna go ahead and use another zip tie. Don't have a bunch of zip ties. I highly recommend you buy them because they are probably one of the most useful things you can have in your garage next to duct tape. Once you make sure that's as snug as it can possibly get, go ahead and take wire cutters and snip it. And then what's nice is we can just go ahead, rotate this a certain way, and just tuck it up in here. So it's totally out of the way, not obstructing the radiator at all. So now that the vacuum line is secured and out of the way, we're gonna find our fuel hose. Might've gotten pulled back into the frame like it did here. So we're gonna need to go ahead and extend this with another one of the hose connectors and the two feet of fuel hose that we had. We're gonna run it down through here and actually down into that little area, down in the lower fairing on the right-hand side, if you can see that. There's a perfect little thing right there to run it through, a little guide. And then we'll just put it right through here and we'll come out next to this hose and look pretty factory. So next we're gonna go ahead and take our other 3 16 inch hose connector and we're gonna go ahead and get it in this hose 
it's a little tricky because you don't have a lot of space to work with here, but with some perseverance, you can go ahead and get it done and make sure that the plastic tabs are flush against the ends of the hose. So you can finagle it, twist it a little bit to kind of thread it in there. So after some finagling, we were able to get the connector into the hose. It's a bit of a tight squeeze there and there's not a lot of hose. So it might be a little easier to do this actually before you reconnect that hose to the tank. That's why, remember when I said to watch the video all the way through? This is why. So going off of memory here a little bit, but um, yeah, now we've got that guy in. So we're gonna wrap a zip tie around this side of the hose again to secure this. And then we will run our new piece of hose here and then back down through the root, which I described earlier. Trim that off. Again, very careful not to nick your frame here. All right, so now we're gonna take one side of our fuel hose and we're going to take the connector and the other piece of fuel hose that runs to the tank and we're going to get this guy on here. And once that's on there pretty snug and secure, you can go ahead and do the same thing and snug it up with a zip tie. Again, once we've got that in a good position, just make sure it is as snug as we can get it. And now that this is all done and we've got our longer piece of hose, much longer, we're gonna go ahead and route this down through our guides we looked at not that long ago. Of course, we're gonna make sure that we're not fiddling too much with any connectors or anything that we wouldn't want touching the exhaust header because it gets really hot and um, yeah, plastic, wire, metal, hot, no good, don't want that. So another thing I just did here in order to help me run the hose, I actually ended up removing the bracket temporarily. So there's a piece right here, it is this guy and this is just a 13 millimeter socket, threads in like this through that. So you just put a 13 mil on this side, spin it counterclockwise, it comes right out. Also on the bottom, there's another bolt that goes in right there, threads in through here. This is just a five millimeter hex bit. So I loosen these two things up because I noticed that actually this connector was kind of flopping around and getting pretty close to the header and came to find that there's a little clip here and somehow it had slipped out. So I went ahead and re-secured that and also made sure that my fan wires and connector and everything else that's electrical is clear of the header. This also gives me an easy way to just run this guy down here and then through the guide down there. And actually we could even go one further and there's a zip tie right here that I think is a little bit loose. We could just slide it in through there. Slip it on through. And go down and through this guide. Right there. And then we can slide underneath, grab that, and we'll run it into the lower fairing in a little bit once we uh, wrap up over here. And now that everything's torqued back up, we're gonna take one last look. Again, when we put everything back together, you wanna make sure that you do it in a way so that there's no wires that are in close proximity to the header, which it looks like we were able to achieve. So we don't run a significant risk of anything catching on fire, which is great. And then down there, if you can see it, where our hose runs this, and right up here into the zip tie, that guy right here, that hose, that is our hose. See it come back up there, and there's where it connects. So I'm gonna flashlight on this so that you can see a little bit better, but if you notice, there is a little space right there next to the hose that is running through the little plastic lower fairing. So we're just gonna go ahead and take our hose and thread it through there as well. And then we'll zip tie it in place like this hose is. I'm actually gonna go ahead and run it around the oil cooler hose because that's the way that this one is going as well. And that'll probably give us a little bit of extra security from it wiggling around and hitting stuff we don't want it to. 
yeah, we have it right there. So we just gotta go ahead and push it through and we will zip tie it and call it a day. So once we have checked to make sure that our hose is fairly taut and there isn't too much slack in it and that it's not making any contact with the exhaust header or anything else, it's gonna get excessively hot. Pull the rest of that slack down through here. We're going to trim it so that it's about an equal length with this breather hose, just so we preserve a somewhat factory look. So we're gonna take our wire cutters again, line that up just about there. Make sure we're even. And we're just gonna go and squeeze really hard. And there we go. Have our hose. So at this point, we're all done. We can go ahead and start getting the bike back together. I did mention zip tying the hose to the fairing, but it was a pretty snug fit getting it in here. If you wanted some extra security, you could wrap a zip tie around both of these hoses on this side and another one on the other side, and that would keep the hoses from moving around. Obviously, you wouldn't want them to get too tight or you would constrict the hose, but just some food for thought. I think that this is pretty secure as it is and isn't really gonna go anywhere. But yeah, again, I'd recommend double checking just to make sure that there's enough clearance with everything between the header and the hose and just everything else that we've touched. And provided that there is, we're good to go and we can call it a day and put the fairings back on. So we're basically done. All that's left is tucking this guy up out of the way here and back behind the tank and frame. And then we're just gonna need to go ahead and replace the lower tank trim panel, the seat, the cowl, and then the side bearing here. Let's go ahead and get started with that. And voila, we are finished. So just to add some additional context, I removed my EVAP canister on my virtual Tuono as a bit of preventative maintenance, as I know that this can create issues down the road with the bike. And I also did it to help enhance my cooling system's performance. It's getting pretty hot here in the summer now, so anything that I can do to keep the bike a little bit cooler is a win in my book. When you're torquing all the bolts up, particularly the bolts that are on the subframe to put the seat back on, be gentle on those, they are riv nuts and can come loose in the subframe if you do torque them a little bit too tight, then your bolt's stuck in there and it's a total pain to get it out. But that's it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you gave me a gentle little click of the like button. Really helps me out, gets my videos recommended to other motorcyclists and we can share this knowledge with the rest of the internet, which is fantastic. Drop a comment below, let me know if this video is helpful and if it's something that you plan to do to your 2 or RSV4. Consider subscribing if you want to see more content with this 2 V4. I ride this bike quite a lot. It's been on the track many times and I've recorded just about all of it. So plenty of awesome riding footage on my channel. Go check that out as well. Great sound clips. I've got an SC Project CRT exhaust on this bike. Thing sounds pretty insane. Beyond that, I've got a 2012 Triumph Daytona 675R race bike that I'm actually running in a club racing series, the California Road Race Association, or CRA, and I've got a 2009 Yamaha WR250X Supermoto that I'm trying to learn clutch up wheelies on so that I can hopefully one day do some pretty sick wheelies on this thing. If you do decide to subscribe, turn on those notifications, find out every time I post a new video automatically. But with that, I will hope to catch you in the next one and hope you have a great rest of your week and weekend. Until then, later.